Really? Think about what business are we in? We are in the brokerage business. The most popular thing to do is just sell the house, right? You just sell the house. You call me and now let me give you the insight. I set you up for a joke a couple chapters ago. And here's the punchline of that joke. Remember the math we did several chapters ago where the client calls you and said, hey, Raymond, I owe 100000 I'm in trouble with the bank. I want to sell the property and avoid the foreclosure process. Can we sell the house? And what is the minimum amount I can sell this house for and pay everybody off? How do you think we got to that math example? And at the time, I told you it's probably the second most common calculation. Here's how you got there. This is exactly how you got there. This lender has called up the borrower and said, you are in default. We want our money today or we're filing foreclosure. And that borrower calls you and says, hey, I want to sell the house. I owe $97,000 on it. I just want to sell it, walk away clean. And you say, okay, I know you have $1,500 in closing costs and Raymond's going to charge me, make you charge 7%. And you say, okay, so what can we list it at? or what's the minimum, and we now do that math that we just learned a couple chapters ago, so let's do it. If I'm getting seven, how much does the client go going to get? They're going to get 93% of the money, so that's 0 0.93 of that amount, which we called X, but it has to pay off all of their bills, which is 98,500, you then divide by 0.93 and you pull up your handy dandy calculator and you go, hey Siri, what is 98,500 divided by 0.93? 104.5. dollars That's the math. That is what you would say this is the minimum that we can sell the house for and pay off your 97000 pay your closing costs, pay my boss Raymond or the, whoever the managing broker is, and you walk away clean. All right? That is how we got to the math. That was the setup for the joke. Here is the punchline. How we got there was because the bank has exercised this acceleration clause on the lender. All right. That would be one of the provisions in default. Now, there are other things that happen. And we said because that IOU that you signed, that financing instrument, that note, has an interest rate that's associated, it has some value. And because of that, they can sell that note to some third party. I know this has happened to you or a friend or a parent or whatever, where you would say, hey, my loan got sold. It originally was between me and Fifth Third, but Fifth Third sold it to Chase Bank. And now I have to make my house payments to Chase, yes, because Fifth Third sold that IOU to the another bank who wanted to have it. They cannot change the loan. You still pay that $555 at 5.31% interest for 360 months or how many are ever left. So the actual loan or the cannot change it's just who you make the payments to. 
and they can sell it because it has value. The second thing is that they will assign the mortgage to go with it. Remember, it's two documents. And how I usually teach this is the IOU is the bark of the dog. Hey, you owe us money. You missed January's payment. Hey, you missed February's payment. And they bark at you. They continually bark and bark and bark and bark. But where the real bite of this is, is this mortgage. Because this is the collateral piece that allows the lender to come and take the house from you if you fail to make the IOU payments. So think of it like this. You've got the bark. And you got the bite. The IOU is the bark. This allows that bank to go, you owe us money. You miss January, you owe us money. The bite comes from the fact of the mortgage. Well, the mortgage really does not have a lot of value, so they don't sell it. What they do is they assign it to go along. So fifth third in this example would sell the note to Chase and they would assign it. And if you remember the assignment means they have changed the rights and responsibilities to a third person and they assign the mortgage to go with it. So there's two documents. They sell the IOU and they assign the mortgage. And now fifth go, third goes, we're out. And now you make all your payments to Chase because of the IOU. And if you go into default, Chase, who now has the mortgage through an assignment, will actually be the one that files the acceleration clause. Okay? So that's how that happens. There is this mortgage and this assignment. There's Now, back to these. Let's change to this color. When you have done what you are supposed to do, you have made all of your house payments like you are supposed to do, 360 payments. What the lender will then do is send you a release of that lien. And think back to the title chapter, and I told you they do that search and what they are looking for is any of these liens that do not have a corresponding release because if there's no release, that lien is still active. And what they want to see is a lien that was made in 1980. And then 30 years later, they see a recording of a release of that lien why 30 years? Because it was a 30-year mortgage. So you get, they got the loan in 1980. And then in 2010, there is a release of that lien. And that house is now free and clear. Because this release got recorded to counteract the original lien that got put on it. In the title theory example... You do what you're supposed to do and you make all your payments to the bank. What the bank then does is call over to that third party owner and say, hey, I need you to deed that property back to the beneficiary. So they deed it back to him. Now, for the gold star of the day, what's the name of that deed? <laughs> what is the name of that deed? That deed actually has a very special name and we've touched on it, right? When the trustee deeds the property back to the original trustor, remember, it's called a reconveyance deed. Reconveyance back to the original person. Now, this person owns the property because they actually have all of the interest and estate back. So no matter whether you're using the iOS or the Android or the beta or the VHS, depending on how you look at it, when these releases get recorded or the reconveyance get recorded, 
That is the offset that that lender, or I'm sorry, misspoke, that that title company is looking for when they do that historical title search for 40 years back or to the root. If the lender fails to do that, they can actually be in trouble themselves. All right. There is a clause that called the defeasance clause. Now, I don't know about you. If you are the younger brother or sister, raise your hand. If you are the older brother or sister, raise your hand. I am the oldest. I have one younger brother. Did you guys ever play that game where you went to your younger brother or sister and went, hey, dude, if you, I'll give you this toy and you give me that toy and we'll swap toys and they gave you that toy and then you kept them both and ran away? Did you guys ever do that to your younger brother and sister? Everybody did. I still do it to my brother. And he's 58 years old. He still falls for it. <laughs> the defeasance clause in the mortgage says that the lender cannot do this. They cannot take your money and keep the lien in place. They can't have it both ways. Once they receive your money, they have to give you the release. And if they fail to give you the release or the reconveyance deed, if you're in the other situation, they could be in federal problems as well. So they cannot keep both. Once you make your payments and you've done what you're supposed to do, they will, in fact, send you the release of that lien. There have been people that go, well, the bank never sent it to me. Yeah, they did. You lost it because they're not going to get in federal trouble by doing this under this clause that requires them to send the release of the mortgage or sometimes it's called the mortgage discharge or the reconveyance deed. They're not going to get in trouble. They've been doing this. This is how they make a living. They can't afford that. So they did that. You just couldn't find it. All right. So that is in the defeasance clause that says they have to do that. Now, we talked about those escrow accounts for your taxes and insurance. There is a clause inside of the mortgage that allows your lender to collect that in your house payment. They will put that in two separate escrow accounts. They will set these up for taxes and the insurance. And there is a law that limits how much they can keep in there. So they're never going to say, well, we really don't know. So just send us 10 grand and we'll put it. In. No, there is a federal law that limits the amount that you can put in those. And they can't have too much money because if they do, they are too in trouble. We are going to talk about this when we get to RESPA. We are not going to talk about the formula that's used, but we all will talk about a little bit more about the amount that can go in this. If you have a second insurance because you live in a flood zone or a flood plain that would require a second type of insurance, true homeowner's insurance protects against fire and slips and falls and things like that doesn't protect you for flood. You would have to get a second flood insurance. If your house requires that, then there may be a second escrow account that would be good for flood insurance uh, premiums, okay? So now here's the strategy I wanna talk about, but I don't want you to get too excited because their next thing we're gonna talk about is kinda of gonna counteract this. It is possible that a buyer could buy a property subject to the loan that's in place. Or they could, well, there's subject to, or they could assume the current loan that's outstanding. So let's talk about the difference in these two. When a person buys a project property subject to the loan that's in place, i.e., hey, I'll make your house payments. Quit claim me the house. 
And what does a quit claim do? It transfers the interest, whatever it is, to the recipient. So if I told a seller, quit claim me the house, I'll take that mortgage, I will buy it subject to your loan that's already in place, and I will just continue making the house payments. If that happens, the purchaser, now this is a tricky word, what that means is the new person that took it subject to is not liable for the debt because the other person's name is still on it. They didn't get a new loan. They bought it subject to the loan that Bob took out and now he quit claimed it to Bill and Bill is making the house payments. If Bill fails to make the house payments, they are going to come after Bob, who they still think is the owner because he's the one that signed all the documents four years ago. So the current owner, which is called the purchaser, is not liable for the debt. It's not my name on it. And if they foreclose, it's not my foreclosure. That is called subject to. Think of it this way. The best way to think of a subject to is when the bank doesn't know.